And Alan Quinlan, good morning to you. Morning, lads. How are you? Good. That's some endorsement. Uh, when you look at Paul O'Connell in terms of his coaching career, he's obviously been in some Ireland camps, been involved with the other 20s, some involvement with the Munster Academy previously, and obviously his time at Stad um, seems to have dabbled and, and stepped away then again at times. It, this could be the ideal fit, but is it fair to say, Alan, that he's getting the job more because of his playing credentials rather than what he's served so far in terms of his time as a coach? Yeah, he doesn't have a big CV from from coaching, so um, it's a little bit different for him. Um, I think there's a confidence there, though. That I, I said this on uh, on news talks uh, radio this morning and the breakfast show that Paul has practically coached the Munster lineup for twelve years and the Irish lineup for twelve years, twelve thirteen years. So. Um, I don't think there's as much emphasis and focus on a forwards coach when you have very experienced players who understand the line out inside out. Um, you don't have to technically coach them on lifting and blocking and in and in in the mall and you know move speed and movements, um, the gaps that you want to leave, and 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 all that kind of stuff because. They self police that themselves, and that's a, a brilliant place for any forwards coach to be, where you go in and you're involved in the line, or you just fine tune it. Whereas I just think that the, the Irish team needs a little bit more guidance, um, experience, and real life experience of a player being there, um, and he needs to steer them and, and organise them in a better way. I've said this for a while, and you know, there's a lot of talk about Ireland's attack. Um, but the, the line-out is, is the perfect weapon to launch attacks from. And it's not about winning mm. the line-out, the, the ball at the front of the line-out, Adrian. It's about how can you get middle to back line-out quality ball delivered on a play to the scrum half who players can run onto it and attack, and it's harder to defend. And you go back to that English game, Ireland had eight line-outs. They won four, lost four. The four they won were quite sloppy. They were quite sloppy. Can, can he fix it, that? Yes, because what I, I tell you what he can do in very simple terms, and going back to the great statement that he made in Crow Park where he puts the fear of God in people and the players around him, he'll put the fear of God in every player there that they know their role inside out and there will be no room for complacency as regards, oh, I didn't, I forgot the line out or I didn't understand that one. And, you know, the lift was half-hearted and, you know, it should have been better. Of course, you're going to come up against good lineouts and uh, teams and top quality uh, opposition who are going to try and master your lineout and figure out where you throw it. And sometimes you call a good uh, call a ball, and the lineout caller has to hold his hand up and say, "Look, it was a bad call," or else the opposition did brilliantly. But too often in the last, even though our percentage level has been high in our lineouts and what we're winning, it's where we're winning and the type of delivery. So. Mm -hmm. You know his coaching CV isn't is very small, but he's done this. He's been in amongst the players, which is exactly what you want to do um, to put pressure on them about the spacing, like a half a yard here or there. Like I mean, up and down the Irish lineout can make a massive difference. One step, if a player is too close, Jenny he should be a step back as regards a position you can win the ball, and it makes a massive, massive difference. So he'll break all that down. And I think, you know, if you come into a lineup, do you can imagine Paul O'Connell uh, and Devin Toner, your two second rows for Ireland at the moment, and a lineup coach comes in to coach them? He has very little to do because they're self policing already. They're already putting pressure on the props, the back rowers. Um, they're running the lineup. But what he'll do now is he'll come in and he'll give that experience of, of leadership, not just for James Ryan, who's potentially going is the caller or Ian Henderson or Ryan Baird or Peter O'Mahony or Caelan Doris, whoever, but he has to develop more leaders who can actually call the line out. So if one of them mm -hmm. gets injured, there's a seamless transition into running a line out. And it sounds very easy, but it's so complex. And that goes down to Quinny, the can I, can, can, well, I ask, can I ask, can I ask you on that? Just, and I won't, might want to come back on, on Paul O'Connell in a second, but just as a slight tangent to what you've said there, just in relation to specifically the roles of um, those involved in the line out, like primarily the hooker, and you're saying maybe there's been at times a lack of quality communication or understanding of what the role is, which points a light for me back on Simon Easterby. And it just struck me as you were talking 
Uh, you know, obviously it's been broken up to this point. They've now decided that Paul O'Connell is amongst the things he's going to do is help fix the line out. Um, and I don't know that that reflects amazingly well on Simon Easterby, who they've moved over now to a defence role and to say he's very excited about that. It, like, if they needed a defence coach at that level, surely they'd be looking to bring somebody in who's a specialist in that area. It looks like an unusual sideways move. Yeah, no, it, it, it to me it, it, it doesn't because Simon is, is the defence before for Scarlets. He's actually a very inspirational guy himself. He's quieter. He's not a line-out expert to the level of Paul O'Connell. I've said this many times. Paul O'Connell is Victor Matfield, Steve Bortwick, um, Ali Williams, these kind of players who are, you, uh, you know, Nathan Sharp for Australia. These are guys who were world-class at what they mm -hmm. did, running a line-out, specifically making the calls, um, not just calling a ball at two, four, and six, but figuring out how the opposition are defending, what they're doing, and and how you combat that, and how you go against that, and how you attack from that. So it sounds quite simplistic, a line-out, that you just throw it to the, the guy at the front of the line and you win your ball, and it's great. But it 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 adds to your attack and the whole thing. Simon wouldn't have been a specialist line-out caller. He wouldn't have been someone who ran the line-out. He wouldn't have been someone, of course, you can coach the line out and you can run the, but to get down to the real nitty gritty stuff, like I'll give you an example. I walked into line outs with, Mon in, with Monster, with Paul, and both of us called line outs together. So he called the full line outs. I called the shortened line outs where I would have stood, stood at scrum half. And I had a better vision of where the opposition were defending. And we had hand signals, buzzwords and calls and, you know, walking into a full line with Paul O'Connell, I actually knew most probably where he was going to call the ball based on what the opposition, the way they were defending, because I was up to speed at his level. So what he has to do, and, and to explain this as simply as I can, is you ideally you want eight or t all the forwards, obviously, but the eight that are starting and the guys in the bench, nearly before any call is made, having a fair idea what call he's going to bring, what what where it's going to be called to, because they look and look at the opposition, and this is down to props and backers who traditionally wouldn't be the guy winning the ball in the air, but so it's it's just bringing everyone up a, a level and making mm. sure their knowledge and understanding. It's the understanding. It's not a, an ability to learn calls and know well this move and that movement is that's call this call and that call. It's actually having an ability that they really understand the line out. And they nearly know where it's going to be called before it is called. And Paul has a great ability to do that. So it's it's it may seem a little bit awkward for Simon Easterby. And, you know, I'm sure he's done a brilliant job with him. But, and he'll acknowledge to himself, this guy is at a different level of running a line out. I've been there week in, week out with him, down in the south of France, playing with Munster, where the crowd are going crazy and there's a calmness about him. Now, you know, I, I've commentated a few years ago and I remember one game in Wales where Ireland lost and one or two calls, Paul, he, he, of course, anybody can make a mistake and call a line out in the heat of the battle. But he's the first to acknowledge and beat himself up over, over that. So even in their reviews, it'll be explained and it'll be, you know, I, I just think it's he, it was too good for them not to bring him in. And, you know, it's a big job coaching and in fairness, you know he he'll he'll get scrutinised very very hard, and you know if Ireland's lineup doesn't go that well in the Six Nations, you know he there'll be pressure on him. But I think this is a, a um, an opportunity. A lot of these yeah. players will 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 respect him as well. Is Paul O'Connell's ambition to be a head coach one day? I don't know, and Paul will tell you nothing. <laughs> um, you know, I think there's a big job and big role in being a head coach and everyone acknowledges that it's a six o'clock in the morning job till a 10 o'clock at night even when you're at home you can never switch off now paul is so gets so stuck into things that i'm sure he's he's working on ireland lineouts already and and analyzing the players and um so yeah of course he has the ability to do that it's just depending on whether he wants it but i think he's he has those natural leadership qualities which of course, it's different being a coach. You can be a great player and a great leader as a captain, but 
you've got to translate it a little bit differently and you've got to understand your players. Not everybody, you can't slap everybody in the back. You have to put your arm around some guys and you have to caress them and move them different ways. And, um, you know, you have to get an understanding and you get experience with that, how you treat people and stuff. So Paul is fiery. Don't, you know, he could, he'll put massive pressure on guys, but the pressure he's probably got to understand this. And, and this is something as a captain, you, you learn is how you deal with guys because giving out to guys or being hard on them can take away their little bit of confidence and they can shrink a little bit. Other guys love it, love being challenged. So it's 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 a big picture on and learning all that kind of stuff. I had fights with Paul over him shouting in the dressing room at, and or saying different things to people and saying, trying to say, some guys are different. They just want to chill out before a game. I remember one game in Cork, he came screaming around the dressing room. Myself and John Hayes were having a grand chat. We were laughing and joking. And he wanted everyone's game face on like every before we went out for the warm up. And I remember having a chat afterwards saying that was my way of keeping my bit of calmness. It wasn't that I wasn't focused. And, you know, he acknowledged that. But look, Paul is a brilliant coach. He's a brilliant leader. And I think he'll bring these guys on to a, to a level where they need to get to because I think they're lacking in confidence. We've seen a lot of movement on in the Irish line out in the last year. And for me, a lot of movement means there's a bit of lack of confidence there and, and they're just going through calls for the sake of it. Why is the movement happening, I would ask? Why is there a need for it? Sometimes you have to have movement and different sort of stuff, but our line-out has been, become a little bit slow, a little bit pedestrian. And, you know, Maro Atoje and Joe Launchbury, with all due respect to them, um, they destroyed that any chance of us playing well in Twickenham in November because... They unsettled our line out so much and they're not the best defensive line out operators in the world they're brilliant rugby players but they're not the best defensive line out operators so there needs to be way more clarity there needs to be you need to expand the line out leadership group the an ability for guys to call the line out right across the back row so if your two seconders are not calling that one of your back rows can can actually make the calls we've relied too much on and, and, and mm. you know, Paul has developed players as a player. Dunica Ryan, someone when I started out, Dunica was so quiet, he he didn't really... Uh, he was a good line-out operator, don't get me wrong, but he wasn't someone who was a line-out caller. He, I, I, never, I didn't really see that in him. But as the years went on, he suddenly became more dominant, confident, and went away and studied unbelievably. Real, Dunica is a real student of the game and became this line-out caller who can walk into a line out for Racing now yeah. and just be calm and call it to the right areas. Mick O'Driscoll, brilliant line out operator, um, Devin Toner, and lots of guys have said they've learned from Paul, you know. So the challenge is now translating that message as a coach because he's now going to have people who are going to, it's not buddy buddy time anymore. You know, he's going to be making a decision and telling Andy Farrell, well, he's a selector effectively now. He's going to be selecting guys in that pack as well. Yeah. Uh, I should say it's seven minutes past nine on this Friday morning. OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Also against Leinster this weekend is the game I just want to focus on for a moment. It's a very interesting Leinster team, but there's also been some very interesting comments coming from the Ulster camp this week. Dan McFarland was asked if he uh, feels sorry for Leo Cullen's plight, I think was the question about how ex Leinster players are performing so well for Connacht and Ulster with that little bit of incentive to play well against their former province. His response, do I feel sorry for Leo? Of course I don't. He sat amongst 10 or 12 of the wealthiest schools in the country, plowing people with rich families through the schools, churning out bursaries to the best prospects. Do I feel sorry for him? That's hilarious. A little bit of needle here, Alan, between Dan McFarland and Leo Cullen, it seems. He's only telling the truth, though, isn't he? <laughs> um, and I don't mean—I don't think he means it in a dis too disrespectfully towards sure. Leo. Um, look, I, I said this before. If I was Leo Cullen, head coach of Leinster, or, um, it's frustrating to lose um, some of your players. I think particularly the ones you really want to keep. Um, he can't keep every player and there's a number of players in all the provinces um, and that's what's happening and that's going to continue to happen because Leinster produced so many players and the school system in Dublin is the envy of people right across Europe because 
they're like mini academies essentially these players are, are um, given proper nutrition advice their uh, availability to brilliant gyms fitness coaches ex international players top quality coaches who are who are working with them in on an individual basis as well so when they come out of school they're far more developed and uh rounded as players than than the other provinces because they're getting that time and investment and and the money is there in these schools and and that's just the way it is like yeah and, and that's the reality um there's a couple of players leo's lost in the last couple of years that will really frustrate the most high profile one is probably joey carberry who's someone who probably could have started as a full back and would be played the loads and loads of games and and end up playing loads which he did before he left but I think it was down to him start wanting to start as a 10 and um you know so fringe players not a problem but I think if you lose one or two of your starters that you want to keep it's very difficult so it's a reality what he's saying it's plain for everybody to see that they have more players to choose from and they are going to produce more players and and I don't think I don't think Leo Cullen's looking for pity because he knows that and um their system which is fantastic and the, and what it's done and uh the way they can they get the players probably at a more advanced stage because they're essentially in mini academies in all the schools so it'll it'll spice it up a little bit um but if i was an ex leinster player playing against leinster um of course you want to play well you want to you know in an ideal world they would be playing back in their own province but um They've integrated into Munster, Ulster, Connacht, and and um, these players, and they, and of course they want to get one up in their old province for sure. Yeah, all right, lots of interesting games as well this weekend. Uh, we're out of time, Quinny. Thanks, a million. Enjoy the rugby over the Thanks, weekend. Lads. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Uh, OTBM live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead.